Hey y'all, it's Andrew with Free Tours by Foot New Orleans. Today, we're gonna take you on a culinary adventure through the French Quarter, show you some of the best places to eat in the neighborhood and where to get some of the classic items. And we have brought in for you an expert who is gonna <laughs> expert. <laughs> give us some know. good advice on that subject today. <laughs> I, well, I will say like, as far as culinary knowledge and culinary passion, like this is the thing, I, I, I love talking about this, but I think yeah. you are a, a level yeah. above me and you've given our culinary tours with Free Tours by Foot yes. for quite some time. Yes, I have. So my name's Kayla Lemaire. I am from Southwest Louisiana, a region called Acadiana. So it's the, the hub of Cajun country. Uh, I lived there pretty much my whole life. Uh, my family on both sides, my mama and my dad, have been in Louisiana since before the United States became the United States. Dang. It gets me so excited. I love talking about Louisiana culture and sharing that with people, but you get me talking about food. Look, I'm, <laughs> we're I'm gonna here do that. for it. I'm we're here gonna, for it, okay? We're gonna do no. that. Well, y'all, if you really get us going on these subjects, this is the thing all of us here love to talk about. We will recommend to you restaurants all over the city. We're focusing mostly, though we'll throw in a few other suggestions on things that are here in the French Quarter. And there's some times when like a food originated in the French Quarter and that means we're gonna see quite a variety of places. We're starting here at the French Market, which is kind of culinary ground zero in New Orleans history. We'll move a little outside of the area over to MRB, Mississippi River Bottom, a little dive bar where we're gonna check out oysters. And then as we get a little further up towards the heart of the neighborhood, we're gonna go to Central Grocery where we will try out a muffalata sandwich. Muffalata. Up beyond that, y'all heard of this one, we're gonna hit, hit up Cafe Du Monde for <laughs> coffee and beignets. And then we'll head across Jackson Square to Tableau, upscale Creole restaurant where we'll try a gumbo. Over beyond that, we're gonna see a cluster of really good restaurants right around the Louisiana Supreme Court. That's gonna bring us to Leah's Pralines. We're gonna see Antoine's, the oldest restaurant in the city. Royal House Oyster Bar, great spot for all kinds of different Cajun and Creole items. We're gonna get some jambalaya there. Yeah. And then we'll finish it off with a po' boy at a place called Killer Po' Boys, located at the Aaron Rose Bar, a little up beyond Bourbon Street. So we're gonna get started mm -hmm. with the French market itself. So Kayla, okay. can you tell us a little bit about like what the, the early history of this place is, why it's so important to food history in Louisiana? This was a native trading ground. So for the Native Americans, before the Europeans ever colonized this area, this was where they met for ceremony and this is where they traded with each other. When the French show up, they recognize that it's already essentially a trading area, see the strategic brilliance of that, and establish their own port here, right? Um, and then trade is happening everywhere, all along the river. There's no organization to it, but when the Spanish take over and towards the end of the 1700s, in order to regulate quality, price, just sort of control the market space, the Spanish decide to consolidate trade into one area and they put that here very close to where that original native trading post was. So it's called the French market, <laughs> but it's really developed by the Spanish. So it's just, we love a good contradiction in New Orleans, <laughs> I think. It's kind of a great expression of that. Um, and then it becomes sort of the first of a whole network of a market system that was the main go-to for food before grocery stores became the norm here. So today when you hit up the French market, yeah, it's mostly souvenir shops, but there is the food section of it, which is fairly small. Right now we're on the souvenir end of it, the flea market, where you can find open tables with all kinds of stuff for sale. We're gonna pass through over to that culinary area where you can find really all kinds of stuff. Yeah but we're gonna focus on some of the things y'all might be able to find in your hometown, which is like seasonings, hot sauces, all the stuff that you can use to put a little bit of a Louisiana spin on things or find the raw materials for full on Louisiana recipes right where you are. So we'll get on over to that and we'll, uh, we'll show you some of our favorites. In about a block of this, you can find a lot of different stuff. It's a huge yes. cross section of local food. I mean, all the classics that we're gonna see during this tour, but also some some less common. You can get some, uh, some really good snowballs. Yes. Some summer specialty here. Alligator sausage. You, know. you also get like lots of really good seafood. There's a, a great yeah. vegetarian largely place over here, but really? also does amazing crab cakes yes. on top of that. Really good vegetarian place, Meals from the Heart. Uh, amazing crab cake taco, one of the best things to eat in the French market, in my humble opinion. And you're a big fan too of the corn. Oh, the roasted corn, yeah. Like, so much of the food that you get here is really heavy and it can be sort of a lot in the middle of the day. And if you just kind of need a little 
something light and a pick me up that roasted corn hits the spot it does a great job i love it and in general portions here are a little bit smaller you can everyone can get something different it's great if you have a group that doesn't it's not always on the same culinary page mm -hmm. yeah so lots of options it's for variety. Just, yeah flexibility i think is really like the byword here yeah, we were a tony's Asheri's house so are we <laughs> okay and like but you grew up with spicy food and i did not yeah so yeah. like tony's is my sort of level the top of your spice okay just interesting. about right, yeah right. versus when you get like a slap your mama out of there which is a brand of hotter spices on the whole and which implies slap your mama on the back saying good job to her not right yeah yeah but you have a lot you have a big <laughs> register of different options you do. you do there's a lot of variety in this there's a number of different brands every family i think sort of has like their household family favorite i personally like to get the low salt or the no salt because they have a high concentration of salt in them, if you want to get your food really flavorful with all of the spices and the heat of the pepper, it can you can over salt your food relatively easily with those kind of things. So I like salt free, no salt, and then just to salt my food myself. Also the hot sauces that are signatures here, I mean most places it's Tabasco or, or crystal, crystal or both. Yeah. And you carry these around with you. <laughs> I do, actually, I happen to have, I just happen to have hot sauce in my bag with me today. But you'll also find these at just about every restaurant table in the neighborhood, so yeah. you'll get a chance to sample one way or another. And then this one's from my kitchen. <laughs> so it's a little worn. But these mm -hmm. are quite different from each other. Yes. And like, yeah. You don't always discover what your own tastes are when you only eat them on things. So sampling them by themselves. Yeah, it's a whole different ballgame. It's kind of bold. So red pepper, cayenne pepper, distilled vinegar and salt in the crystal hot sauce. Uh, crystal is one of the most popular hot sauces in New Orleans. The family who started this, the Balmer uh, group, Balmer bought a snowball syrup company from his brother-in-law that also happened to include this hot sauce recipe. No way. Yeah. Uh, and he started making no. the hot sauce and now it's like a super, it's really popular. But um, it has a fuller body and it's less vinegary uh, and I think a little less spicy than, than Tabasco, which is this very specific kind of pepper, the name of which is escaping me at the moment. Um, but it's grown out in Avery Island, Louisiana. Yeah, that hits pretty hard. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's high, oof, that's a high level for me. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> so the capsum frutescens, I knew I was going to remember it, is the good pepper. Good job. Thank good you. job. Is the pepper in this. And this, I, so this is from Cajun country. And I really kind of think of this as a Cajun hot sauce. My grandfather always had a jar of vinegar and peppers on his kitchen table. And he would like spice up everything with this vinegar pepper that he kept on his table so so we go with the milder okay. one so second. this one i think is milder it's fuller bodied um you can you can overdo this and not kill the food you can go a little bit too far with tabasco and really kind of ruin a dish with it so be very conservative with this this you can just pour it out on there and it's fine okay. so go oh ahead. yeah 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 that's way more for, for the, the spice averse, that is way more within, I'll say, my wheelhouse. Growing up with like a little bit of spice in Louisiana, yeah. there's something kind of, there's something kind of warm and savory about it too. Yeah, and I think it has, oh, I got hot sauce all over me. It has more like depth of flavor, I find yeah. too. It's, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. little bit more interesting of a dynamic of flavor than just like. It's adding more than just spiciness to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. Nice. So, y'all, the next place we're going to go is MRB, Mississippi River Bottom, little dive French Quarter bar with oysters and a whole lot else. Not a place that a lot of tourists notice. So, we'll take you a touch off the beaten path. Off yeah, we go. I like it. Let's do it. Y'all, we have settled in around a luxuriant half dozen oysters <laughs> in the courtyard of MRB. Really Y'all can see an oyster goes further in Louisiana than in yeah, most places. And Kaylee, you told me as we were getting ready for all this, yeah. an awesome story that I did not know about the beginnings of the oyster industry in Louisiana. Can you share yeah. that? Absolutely. So um, the Louisiana oyster industry, kind of as we know it here in the Southeast, it's really established by Croatian and Slavonian immigrants who came to New Orleans around the middle of the 1800s. And they came to the Gulf Coast, saw the abundance of oyster, and really started to observe 
what the flow of the water along the river was, what side of the river was giving the most salinity, the most nutrients to the oyster. And then they planted essentially seed oysters by hand, one at a time, spacing them out to make sure that they had enough room to grow and that they were in the greatest flow of nutrient and salinity for the oyster. And that's sort of over time why, how you get this like large oval shaped, really juicy and succulent oyster. I mean, they're big, they're <laughs> big ones. That's a big one right there. Yeah, no, these are beastly. Yeah. And, and also like good point that you made while we were talking about this, it's like versus people who are used to like East Coast oysters, you talk about like particular bays and different salinity and, and really distinguishing one from another. And just kind of like a Gulf oyster is a Gulf oyster yeah. across the board. So you can get these at all kinds of places in the French Quarter and they're the same thing where a restaurant's real signature comes in is in their other oyster preparations. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And there's some nuance in, in the different varieties of Gulf Coast oyster, but for the most part, they're all relatively the same. Uh, the Gulf Coast produces more oysters than any other oyster producing region of the United States, which is another interesting fact. Um, so you get raw, obviously, oyster, uh, very common here. Uh, Another legacy of the Croatian immigrant is the charbroiled oyster, which I think is a signature way that New Orleans does oysters. And uh, so basically what they do is they take an oyster on the half shell like this, they douse it in a, a melted garlic butter, put it over a live flame and, and roast the oyster over live flame and a well done charbroiled oyster that doesn't have a lot of flair to it rivals the best cut of filet mignon you have ever had like in just pure rich succulents and if you're not into the raw oyster there are lots of cooked oyster options too baked oyster uh, oysters rockefeller was invented here in new orleans and so we also do a lot of mix of different greeneries and 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 cheeses and sauces and, and baked with the oyster as well but for me really the the gold is in the raw oyster and the charbroiled yeah, oyster so that's, you can't get enough that's where it's at options galore Shall we dive yeah. on in? Yeah. Okay. So everybody's got a way, right? There's different ways you can do this. Um, so we're gonna do this my way. So. Okay. Right. I will learn. I will okay. learn. So I like to take take a little, like take a little lemon, just kind of kind of lemon them up a little bit. Cocktail sauce and then some horseradish, and you can throw some hot sauce in there too if you want a little Tabasco, a little Crystal. I like just Dollop. a tiny little bit with my oyster, and I don't even bother with a cracker, but you can put it on a cracker if you want. Mm. These are good. And I wanna point out how easily this oyster came off of this shell. Shucking really is a skill, y'all, and it is one thing not everybody's mindful of if they're not used to eating oysters. Tipping shuckers is pretty standard practice. So on top of tipping a waiter, heading over to your shucker because they are the real professional that got this ready for you. Just like waiters are going to often share their tips with the people in back of house, the culture here is to throw a favor to the back of house that made this as good as it is for you. I wish I could taste this. is so good. <laughs> Well, as we step on from this, the next thing that we're going to get onto is something that's pretty much available all year round. We're going to step into another European immigrant story. We're going to get a Mufalata sandwich. Oh, yeah. yeah. Over at Central Grocery. So we're going to be heading a little up to Cater Street parallel with the French Market. So that's up next. We are outside of Central Grocery Company on Decatur in the Lower French Quarter. And a lot of people don't know that New Orleans cuisine is largely influenced by Italian culture as well. From the late 1800s into the early 19 teens, almost 300,000 Italian immigrants migrated to New Orleans. They came to work in agriculture on the docks as grocers, and most of them were Sicilian. So Salvador Lupo opened Central Grocery in 1906. Uh, to service the mostly Sicilian population that lived in this neighborhood. And did you know that they used to call this area Piccolo Palermo for all of the Sicilians who lived here? Yeah, after the capital, capital city of Sicily. Right, so, exactly. <laughs> And you still see a lot of businesses with Italian names or that are, have Italian products without being so obviously named. There's Cafe Spisa 
here in the French Quarter. We also have Angelo Bricado's, the Italian bakery, which yes. used to be in the quarter and it's now out in mid city. So it's yes. like, it's an innocuous presence, but if you really know where to look, it's all over town. Yes, yes, yeah. So we're gonna get our hands on their signature item, muffalata yeah. sandwich. Absolutely. My God, yes. Oh. <laughs> Cheers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. So what these guys give us is the original version of this sandwich that's like served tons of places in town now, yeah. but that like a lot of tourists don't realize is a signature New Orleans dish. Absolutely. And a great one for a touristic day because it's like relatively light. You can carry it with you. It's supposed to be cold. Inexpensive. You can get it in halves and quarters a lot of places, yeah. so you don't have to commit to that much food and you're not gonna feel super weighed down. You can like continue your day after this without a nap. Yes, absolutely. So let me talk about what this is. This is mufaleta bread, uh, which is where the sandwich gets its name, but we've sort of, you know, bastardized a lot of language here in <laughs> New Orleans. So we say muffalata, um, but it is a sandwich with salami, mortadella, provolone, Swiss cheese, and then the uh, true crown jewel is this olive salad. So. We've got pimento, green olive, kalamata olive, some cauliflower, some Italian herbs in here, and some really good olive oil. And you can get olive salad in jars in a number of different brand names here in New Orleans too, so that's a huge, huge thing. I always tell vegetarians, if you get really hungry, just buy a jar of olive salad. There's absolutely <laughs> no shame eating it out of the jar with a spoon. Um, and it goes great on pasta and pizza and salad, and so you can bring that home with you and use it in a lot of different things in your own kitchen. Um, but yeah, so Central Grocery, Salvador Lupo starts this tradition of the muffalata at Central Grocery and now muffalata is everywhere in the city of New Orleans. Everybody has their favorite. You can get it um, room temperature like this. A lot of places toast the sandwich for you, so if you prefer warmed meat and a kind of melty cheese and a little bit of toasty bread, you can get it that way. Panini. Mm -hmm. It's totally your, there's no right or wrong way, right? It's you, 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 New Orleans, you do what you wanna, okay? So you can have it however you like it. I like it like this because I like, like Andrew said, you can take it with you. It's a really good holdover. I've eaten a 48 hour old muffalata before. <laughs> just like don't, deciding whether to confess that me, halfway you know, through. Like, <laughs> you do what you gotta do sometimes, you know? It's been a long night or whatever. And I think one of my favorite things about Central Groceries, when you go there today, it is still an Italian grocery store with all these important things. And as you walk through, it's a line. You're not sitting down inside. This is a grab and go restaurant. Yes. It's a deli, basically, which serves one thing, more or less. But you get to see all this other stuff situated conveniently along the route as you go. It's hard not to shop and make a mental <laughs> list of all of the imported yeah. Italian things that you want to bring home with you when you're standing in line for your muffalata. And there is seating inside. It's just very small. It fills up really fast. And so it's a great grab and go kind of a thing. Yeah, so riverfront. You're gonna take your meal outside on a nice day. One great place to get it. Y'all, we're on our way walking towards Cafe du Monde and we're taking a little bit of a back route. The other side that all the French market shops face out onto is, uh, it's happening over there. So we're choosing the secluded, peaceful route. Yes. This is Dutch Alley. And if, uh, if you took this tour live, this is one of the tours that we offer on a daily basis. So if you took this tour with us in person, this is one of the spots you'd be seeing, this cool little undiscovered side of the French Quarter. And Kayla is very possibly the person you'd be doing it with. <laughs> and it would include some of the restaurants we're going to and, and others not. And it actually, even as a pay what you will tour, the usual thing that we do at Free Tourist by Foot, it still nonetheless includes all this insight and some sampling and all that. And so y'all know, if you've watched any of these before, how Free Tourist by Foot works, <laughs> the tours are all free if you choose, they're pay what you will if you choose, and you decide at the end exactly what you wanna do. And if y'all wanna treat this video the same way, you can find Kayla's tip information down in the description. So please go looking for that. It would be a huge help keeping everything going over here. So, y'all, if you were to walk down this alley as we're approaching Cafe du Monde, you also get one more cool little Easter egg, which is a window back here that shows oh, yeah. the beignet making <laughs> process, which is not as it would have been done by those folks. It's been industrialized. There's machinery for it now. But there's also some really cool handwork that goes on. 
a lot of tossing of beignets yeah. from an assembly <laughs> line back into the fryer, which is really fun to watch. And also on this side is the to-go line, which is where you get your beignets the most expediently. We're gonna go that route and enjoy them elsewhere, which is what usually I'd advise for y'all to do as well. Thank you very much. Yo, we've climbed up to <laughs> Washington Artillery Park with the overlook of Jackson Square to enjoy the goods. And it occurred to us, we gotta, we gotta share some, some tips with y'all. So, few things. First, you gotta bring cash with you when you visit Cafe du Monde. Yes, cash only. Cash only, as a lot of places in the French Quarter and in New Orleans in general are. You shouldn't do what I'm doing, which is wearing dark colors while eating beignets, yeah. because I'm going to have this stuff all down me in a second. But uh, I think besides... Oh, and then an order is three beignets. That's worth knowing. If yes. you, you can't get a beignet, you got to get three, yeah. bare minimum. Absolutely. And I would say avoid Café du Monde in the height of the day. So go like early in the morning, I would say before 7, 8. They're open 24 hours, so you have plenty of time to get beignets. Don't wait in the big long line. Wait until you're pre-gaming for the night and you need a good, a good bready foundation for your drink <laughs> or at the end of your party and you want you know to absorb some of the alcohol that you've got lingering uh, yeah but i would avoid it you know i would say between i don't know 8 39 and 7. Yeah. <laughs> so if you get this in the shop you get it in a uh on a little saucer but if you get it this way you get it in a bag completely embedded in powdered sugar, <laughs> so just drowning in it. And you can put it in your coffee if you get the coffee, but uh, otherwise you just have a great excess of powdered sugar and it's gonna feed the sparrows later Yeah, it's on. more powdered sugar than any human being should consume yeah. in one sitting. Uh, they're usually pretty square like this. This one's kind of a little, must have been an edge piece that <laughs> kind of just got tossed in there. Um, it's fried dough. They, they roll it out to a very specific thickness uh, and they toss it and they, so says that to get, it's a puff right, you've got to get that thickness correct and you also have to do the toss. I've made these at home. I think the thickness matters. I think the, the heat of your oil matters. I don't know that the toss is absolutely necessary. I think it's more for showmanship than anything else. Uh. Another very important thing that I just did badly is you should never bite into a beignet and then breathe. <laughs> yeah, I luckily not. exhaled and it went flying. But if you inhale, you'll suffocate. So Yes. You will you will smother your friend in sugar if you exhale and you will potentially kill yourself if you inhale. So hold your breath while you're taking your bite of your beignet. This one's not puffing too much. Yours is puffing pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're not all perfect, but... People from here, y'all, so beignets are a thing that definitely we partake of. I've been eating these my whole life. But um, people have their favorites. You know, Cafe Dumont's not the only place to get them. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, some people who are Cafe Beignet loyalists, and mm -hmm. there are several locations of that throughout the French Quarter that tend to have player pianos, which is fun. Uh, and then one of the classics was Morning Call out in City Park, which is now a Cafe Dumont location. So if you want to get Cafe Dumont, the real thing, on a waterside scene, outdoors, with more room to move and like kids running around having a good time. Live music. Not that out. And sometimes live music too. Yeah. Like the one in City Park is stunning. And y'all can watch our City Park video to see that and plenty else. And there's lots of fun stuff to do in City Park. Family friendly stuff. So. That's right. Yeah. So, we enjoy the rest of this? Yeah. One of the strangest things about, you know, we're filming this in early 2021 about the last year was seeing Café du Monde empty, looking like oh it was... Oh my gosh. No tables. It was just... It was kind of eerie, actually, yeah. to come down here and um, have no movement, no activity. It is a 24-hour spot, so pretty much any time of day you come to the French Quarter, there's something happening. It has been a really tough year for French Quarter businesses, and that's one of the reasons why. I mean, I think there's a lot of relief for people around the notion of restaurants being able to survive, because we have seen some yeah. restaurants... Uh, sadly depart from this world yeah. we have also seen a lot of people in service careers who maybe don't you know don't individually have the renown that a restaurant does yeah. have some really really hard times yeah. so there is uh there is some delight to seeing as cafe du monde is the barometer of the neighborhood 
the sign of you know liveliness and people being able to make a living again yeah and there's a lot of really there's a lot of small kind of you you probably don't know about it unless you know about it really great restaurants in new orleans and um i sort of when when all of that started i kind of like <gasps> i got like really afraid yeah, of like are, what would be left when it was all done so but a lot of restaurants have done a really good job of of shifting and, and accounting and doing what they could um but we did lose some giants yeah. Heartbreaking. So, um, to lost friends. To lost friends. But it's crazy. Coming back better than ever, y'all. That's right. Come help out. So we've made it to our next stop. We are at Tableau, which is a Creole restaurant. We'll be getting into the Cajun Creole distinction a little bit later on. And this is part of the Brennan family family of enterprises. Huge restaurant family in New yeah. Orleans. Yeah, yeah. And the history there goes back pretty far. So the... Yes, yeah, so Owen Brennan was the original Brennan family restaurateur. He opened Brennan's uh, first restaurant on Bourbon Street in I think 1944, sometime in the, in the 1940s. So he's running this piano bar and there is a restaurant across the street that goes up for lease. And Brennan's like, I want to get into the restaurant business. I'm going to open up a restaurant. And Arno Kozanov, who was the original restaurateur at Arno's Creole Cottage, a, a, another huge restaurant here in the French Quarter, was a regular patron at Brennan's Bar. And so he's hitting Arno up for some info on the restaurant business, and Arno basically tells him, you can't be a restaurateur, Brennan, you're Irish, and all Irish people know how to do is ball potatoes. And so Brennan kind of takes that takes the right my job, takes that dare right and goes into the restaurant business opens up Brennan's View Carey restaurant on Royal Street um, and his little sister Ella goes to work for him I think she was 19 whenever she went to work for her brother and the restaurant wasn't doing that great but then Ella kind of took over she taught herself everything that she could possibly learn about French cuisine she made herself an authority of French cuisine in the United States and she works with a chef and she's a woman in the restaurant business who commanded respect when not a lot of women were in the industry to begin with and it was even harder for women to sort of get that type of exposure and get that kind of respect but from what i understand when she walked into the kitchen i mean everybody was on their best and she's a renowned figure at this Absolutely. point she's, like, she's passed away but she's a legend in she the is a legend world. in the new and in the culinary world at large yeah. you know she um she was good friends with and sat at the table with a lot of well-known French chefs in the United States. I mean, she was a tour de force of her own, for sure. And when you look at her life, it leads over into Commander's Palace, but there are a lot of Brennan family restaurants and a few different Brennan family enterprises. Yes. So this is part of the Dickie Brennan's family of restaurants, which is a series of restaurants, each with a different name and kind of menu and identity. This is a upscale Creole restaurant, so you're looking at a certain subset of Louisiana food there. Yeah which in particular is going to inform what we eat when we go inside. But if you come to these, because there are several of these restaurants in this chain, not quite a chain really, not what a chain implies, but in this family, you are able to have this economy of scale that means they cut their own steaks, they cure their own meats, they're going to be doing their own, uh, making their own sausage, lots of other things that a single restaurant by itself has a much harder time doing. So we're going to be trying their chicken and andouille sausage gumbo, a Creole style gumbo. Let's head on in. Yeah, let's do it. So we have a bowl of Creole gumbo. So gumbo is really, in its original version, kind of a fusion between Native American and West African cuisine. It was about 1720, the first slave ship showed up in New Orleans, and in comes this infusion of West African peoples who brought their cooking skills with them and their culinary traditions that are probably, in my opinion, the dominant thread through New Orleans cuisine today, even more than French in a lot of ways, and the culture as well much more Afro-Caribbean in its characteristic than French. Um, so the African people brought with them a vegetable that they called kingambo and we call okra. Now the natives also had an ingredient that they called kambo, which was the sassafras. The dried leaf of the sassafras was used to thicken stews and sauces and basically the okra thickened the stew that was being prepared as well. 
And so those two linguistic words, kingambo and combo, kind of come together and give us what we call today gumbo. And in turn, you have like the thickening agent. Yes, and sassafras is file. So if you see file, F-I-L-E, excellent thing, goo, on a menu in association with gumbo, which you will in New Orleans, it's everywhere. Um, That's what that is. It's sassafras, and it was a Native American. They used it in Native culture for culinary and medicinal purposes in a lot of different ways. And roux gets all the credit, but it's one of three thickeners going on there. So you have a French one, a Native American one, and a West African one. And you don't need a roux to make a gumbo. So a lot of times people say, like, here's my whole thing. There's not always like a right, right way to do New Orleans food because we're a a rich, dynamic, a tapestry of peoples and everybody's got their own sort of flavor and their flair that they put on things and there's a lot of right ways to do stuff. But there are definite wrong ways to do things. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, when people talk about you have to have a roux to have a gumbo, you know, I have to interject and say, well, that's not 100% correct. I grew up in Cajun country, southwest Louisiana. My family uh, did make roux-based gumbos, but we more often made an okra-based gumbo. There's no roux in it at all. Shall we dive in and see what opinions are of this Creole gumbo with its relatively pale roux? So yeah, so this is a a very good description, pale roux gumbo. Uh, One of the things that's interesting about gumbo is it does kind of occur on a spectrum of color. Uh, And this being somewhere I would say in the middle to lighter side. Um, you will get more of a tomatoey color, a tomato as an ingredient in a Creole gumbo than you will in a Cajun gumbo. We could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, more we'll draw those distinctions too. soon. Um, so this is a chicken and sausage or chicken and andouille gumbo, Creole style. So let's do it. Dive in. Definitely a Creole gumbo. Yeah, yeah, very. Got some filet in there. Let me taste that. It does have a, like a tomatoey kind of mm-hmm. element to it. Yeah, yeah, the tartness is really mm-hmm. forward. Um, I'm used to Cajun gumbos from where I grew up too, even yeah. though it wasn't as much a thing that my family made. So yeah, this it's, it's like it's still a novel flavor to me. My default image of what a gumbo is. This yeah. is like a little off center from that. A little off center. That what's the best gumbo in New Orleans? <laughs> it's know? the because one your mama made. It's the one. It's always the one your mama made. <laughs> the one know? my mama made. <laughs> it's the one James's mama made. <laughs> Um, so we haven't talked about Trinity. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Let's, let's do uh, it. So Trinity is a trio of vegetables that's used in pretty much every Cajun and Creole dish. It's onions, celery, and green bell pepper. Similar to vegetables used in Caribbean cooking, and also very, very close to a French mirepoix, which is onions, celery, and carrots. And we may not have had a huge abundance of carrots here. The Spanish didn't really care for root vegetables very much, but onions grow wild here. So it's possible the original gumbo is like wild onion tops and and um, celery. And then, you know, maybe they substitute a little bit of a bell pepper instead of a carrot because the Spanish were like, we don't eat things that grow under the ground. <laughs> and to our to our point about strong opinions, we had a, a note in a previous video, a strong opinion about what is gumbo that has carrots? It's called soup. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. There's yes. no such thing. There's no such thing as gumbo <laughs> with carrots. Um, and I've seen like black eyed peas and gumbos here, which for me doesn't feel like an authentic ingredient. That's kind of fusion y, yeah. You know, it's kind That's of like a New fusion. Year's food meets gumbo yeah, in the winter absolutely. kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. So people take a lot of liberty, and there's a lot of experimentation that goes on. Uh, there's a great restaurant uptown New Orleans called Saffron that serves. Um, Indian cuisine and they have kind of fused a lot of Creole elements and they have a curry gumbo on their menu. My God, yeah, so there's, I haven't tried that. Yeah, the, you know, so again, it's like, the bottom line is like, is it good? <laughs> you know, does it taste good to you? Well, then it's good, you know, it's like, it doesn't have to be, right. And people always ask me, where do I get authentic gumbo in New Orleans? Yeah. And I have to say, well, everywhere, baby, because you're in New Orleans. <laughs> So it's all authentic. The question is, where do I get good gumbo yeah. in New Orleans, right? Yeah, yeah, and gumbo that you're gonna enjoy personally. Absolutely, all so, you gotta do is like it. That's, that's what good food is. <laughs> so from here, after enjoying this Jackson Square yeah, view for a few view, minutes, right? we're gonna be making our way down and walking further up into the quarter to like kind of one of the best restaurant hubs that there is. We're passing by some real icons, yeah. but we're gonna get <laughs> a relatively early dessert.
in the form of Leah's praline. Oh, right. Okay, good. Let's go do that. I'm going to save that. For... Second dessert of the day. <laughs> Second dessert. Oh, gosh. <laughs> We're taking a brief stop by Antoine's. This is like a cannot skip it Absolutely. icon. And I think maybe one of the only, if not the only place where the sign that says since 1840, like a crazy early date is actually accurate. Is actually accurate. And it is the oldest existing restaurant in the entire city of New Orleans. Founded in 1840 by Antoine Alcitor, who was a French transplant, came to New Orleans as a 19 year old kid and started working uh, at a boarding house just down the street and then eventually opens the first Antoine's restaurant, which wasn't at this location. It was basically where the courthouse is now. And then they've been in here since the 1860s. Um, there's 14 dining rooms in Antoine's. They all have a theme. I've been if lost you, in this building. Like, this it's very just so easy to much get lost. Antoine's. Um, if you if you actually come to New Orleans and you take a tour with us, you get to go inside Antoine's and kind of see some of those rooms and talk a little bit more about the restaurant and what they offer. They're a very traditional French style restaurant. They brought fine French dining to New Orleans for the first time. And it's really the French who invent, so to speak, what we think of as a fine restaurant mm -hmm. today. Uh, Antoine's brings that here. And now you have, I mean, just in this, like walking a block or two from this location, you have Brennan's restaurant, you have Galatoire's and, and uh, Arno's down on Bourbon Street, your Antoine's here. So a lot of old school New Orleans fine dining happening just in this little area here. Uh, Antoine's is a do not miss. They have this amazing uh, Café Brulotte Diablique and it's a Café Brulotte is a burnt coffee. So they take this coffee and then it has like cognac. Uh, has it some orange, some like Some fall orange spices. peel and yeah, some cardamom and clove, I think. And it's then, like a mulled coffee kind of. And then they light it on fire right there. So, but it's like the perfect end to a decadent French meal. So a must, must do if you ever come to eat here. And also invented Oysters Rockefeller right here at Antoine's restaurant. And it never had spinach in it to begin with. A mix, mix of greens that so. was like proprietary and they still yeah. alone have the family is, recipe. Though. I know what it is. Come to New Orleans, <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> And when they serve it, they give out these little cards that say the number of your order on it. So yes. there's like a little luxury you souvenir do. that you get. And it's it's a very different experience from like looking at the McDonald's sign and it's saying over blank million served. You know, it, it, Absolutely. it really like feels a bit more intimate. Yeah. So and for y'all in general, this courthouse that we're next to, the whole area around it, like if you just want one area to go to for super good food in the quarter, yeah. it's one of the best hubs of restaurants. You got Napoleon House, which is a real neighborhood icon, another good spot for mm. uh, Muffaletta as well as former home, tragically, oh. of K. Paul's, Paul Prudhomme's <laughs> restaurant, <laughs> which like one of Kayla's favorites. So oh. there have been losses, but the block is still great. And there's a lot to see over there. We're actually gonna hit up one of the restaurants on the block. Okay, so we just came across the street from Antoine's, stopped by Royal House Oyster Bar, and we got ourselves some blackened chicken and jambalaya. The first of our Cajun <laughs> menu items for the day. And, Look at that brown uh, jambalaya. It's good. <laughs> it's, it's, that's how you know Cajuns. Everything's browner. <laughs> that's right. <Yes. laughs> or yes. blackened in the case yes, of the chicken. It's blackened or browned. Yeah. And and this is this is where your expertise truly lives. So uh, so we're gonna see what you think. <laughs> All right. And, Should I taste it first? Uh, is yeah, that what yeah, we're Yeah. Go okay. for it. Go for it. I'll I'll dive in with you. All right. Got it. So we got some sausage up in here. That includes some of that. Oh man. That's good. That tastes like home. Mm -hmm. James, I don't know if your mom's gonna beat this one. <laughs> and we gotta do our blackened chicken. <laughs> I took too much to talk. Hang on. <laughs> oh, that's, that's very good. Yeah. So, there's a very small sort of window of getting it right when it comes to jambalaya as far as I'm concerned. And I haven't had a lot of jambalaya in New Orleans that I honestly would stand behind and recommend to many people. It's just the truth. But this is really good. I'm actually kind of impressed. And it doesn't have, um, it is more of a Cajun style, Cajun style jambalaya um, than a Creole, which is most of what you find, most of what mm -hmm. you find in New Orleans. Which yeah. is appropriate, as, as, as we've discussed, like people come to New Orleans thinking, oh, Cajun food, but yes. that is a recent connection. Yes. And we've actually kind of introduced the reason why. Do you want to share that story? Sure. Um, so 
a lot of people think Cajun and Creole are the same, but they're actually two completely different cultural groups, right? Um, Creole is New Orleans, it's sort of French colonial, Spanish colonial mix. Um, but Cajuns begin their journey up in the northeastern maritime of Canada. So before the French ever come down to New Orleans, they are up in the Canadian maritime in a region called Acadie, which meant land of plenty, also known as Acadia. And they were exiled from that region uh, and eventually migrate and make their way down uh, to Louisiana. And the Louisiana descendants of those Acadian exiles are the Cajuns. Acadian, 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 Cajun, Cajun, Cajun. Yes, Cadian. Doesn't take long. Cadian. There's a lot of similarity in Cajun food and Creole food because we're sourcing the same land. Essentially, we're eating the fruit of the land and that's basically the same in the Southwest along the bayous and down in the swamps as what you're eating here in New Orleans. A lot of seafood, a lot of meats. But there are some big differences. The lack of tomato being one of them, right? So uh, a lot of people kind of will simplify things and say they're the same. Cajun and Creole are the same. Just Creole food has tomato and Cajun food doesn't, right? And that's really kind of an oversimplified difference. It's like really noticeable difference, but it's not remotely the only one yeah exactly not remotely the only one so we both eat things like gumbo but uh, Cajuns tend to make a darker roux we don't use as much filet and no tomato at all you put a tomato in your Cajun gumbo you are excommunicated <laughs> you lose your Cajun card you can't go back you know like it's a very serious culinary offense um, jambalaya is the same we use a roux base instead of instead of like a tomato base for the jambalaya so it's brown we call it brown jambalaya as opposed to red jambalaya which you would get here in new orleans cajun people were this really like obscure unknown subgroup of american culture um, until the 70s really uh, ella brennan who we talked about um, uh, when we were over at tableau started commander's palace uptown in new orleans she had been all around the world studying French cuisine. She met Alice Waters out at Chez Panis in Berkeley, California. Alice Waters was doing uh, this farm to table, which they weren't calling it farm. We call it farm <laughs> to table now. They used to call that eating. <laughs> you know, now, now we call it farm to table and we charge extra for that. Because you know? it means they don't stock their stuff from Cisco. Exactly. They are sourcing the food as close to the table as you can possibly get. And that was a movement that really started with Alice Waters in Berkeley, I think as probably a, a, an extension of like the hippie, hippie sort sure. of commune, yeah. right? But Ella knew Alice and she was really inspired to do a regionally based cuisine, drawing from Creole and Cajun and, and all of the dynamics that were going on uh, at the Louisiana table, right? Um, she needed a chef to do that. Most of the chefs cooking in French restaurants in New Orleans were uh, French trained chefs. They didn't understand what Cajun was at all, uh, but she ended up hiring a cook, self-taught cook from Opelousas, Louisiana named Paul Prudhomme. He came in, he knew exactly what she wanted. He could easily wrap his mind around sort of using all of these different culinary um, expressions of Louisiana in one place and he put Commander's Palace with Ella Brennan, put Commander's Palace on the map. He put Cajun food in the American consciousness. He is the reason why you even know about Cajun food and he's why you associate it with New Orleans. He's the grandfather of Cajun cuisine in the sense that he made it known, yeah. you know, but the grandfathers of Cajun cuisine are the actual grandfathers of Cajun people. And, right, who, who, like, who are cooks, you know, they're happens, cooking. This is that moment when he was of the grandfather generation and he, he yes. passed away in 2015. He so. did, he did. But yeah, he grew up on a farm. There was no electricity. I mean, talk about farm to table. You know, he learned to cook sitting, as all Cajun kids do, <laughs> sitting on the counter, looking in the pot, watching, you know, your, your parents or your grandparents prepare the food. Life was hard. You worked all day. You worked for everything you had. You put everything in a pot and you went, my, you know, my grandparents raised their first seven children in a two room house. You know, there wasn't a big kitchen for Mama to make all kinds of things, you know, everything went in a pot and you just sort of stewed things together all day long as you were doing all of the other chores that just a very laborious life required of you, right? Yeah. You find with Cajun food in New Orleans is it's this, it's this, it's a little bit Cajun Food 101, 
and it's yeah. also very fancied up Cajun food. It's not the family style approach yeah. and the like what's necessarily the what's in season right now approach that would be considered really essential to Cajun food at the, in the places where it's served yeah. out of homes. Absolutely. Our next stop is going to be going right around the corner across the street from Antoine's and hitting up Leah's Praline Shop. So we've made our way to Leah's Pralines, and there's a lot of praline shops in the quarter, different favorites for different people, but mm -hmm. this is your favorite. What's the story This here? is my favorite. Leah's Pralines is the oldest existing praline shop in the French Quarter, and it is still family owned from the original family who first opened it uh, in the 1940s. So uh, I like it because it's the oldest, but they also are one of the best candy shops in New Orleans. They have handmade chocolates in there, absolutely gorgeous. They make their own caramel. They make uh, the chocolate with really high quality European chocolate that, that, that they have imported. Um, there's a lot of great other New Orleans foodstuffs like Arno's Romalade sauce and Steen syrup and local honeys and locally made pepper jellies and, and uh, other types of food other than praline that you can get and makes great gifts to send back home to folks, you know. Just like the French market, this is a great place for souvenirs for other people or for yourself yes. and it is also at the same time a place where it's great to go and get the article completely fresh because the stuff that's been just made is just yes. mwah, the best that's a really good point andrew i'm glad you brought that up when you order or when you eat pralines in the french quarter in new orleans you want to get them in a place that's making them yeah you really want them fresh they they have a decent shelf life but it's it's not the same as when they've been made within you know a few hours or a day uh, of when you get to eat them. Yeah, and that's good. That goes for everything they make here. Stuff's made in-house. I looked at their their turtles, which are the chocolate, caramel, and nut combo, which like oh, look like exactly like the ones my grandma used to make. <laughs> um, but the pralines are the signature, so yes. we got one. Okay. You want to yeah. give it a try? Yeah. Here we go. Grab yourself a piece. Ooh, hardening up nicely. Mm. <laughs> Very... Now, praline, very sweet. It's basically caramelized sugar and pecan. It's a nice creamy one, though. It's a nice creamy one. And they do have the cream, yeah, the texture is really great. Um, sweetness level is high, but this might actually be a creamy one because the creamy ones I find, like the fat in the milk kind of cuts the sweetness a little mm -hmm. bit and they tend to not be like so tartly, not tartly sweet, but sharply sweet. Kind of cutting, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, these were fresh mellow. made. These are still kind of a little bit warmish just, yeah just yeah. barely there's like tiniest little bit I'm of tack it's, it's right should we talk about um, the elephant in the room right <laughs> <laughs> so we've been saying praline 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 right. so oh, very good wait, thank you um and not everybody <laughs> says it that way Correct. and if you stand outside the shop long enough you will hear someone say let's stop in for a praline a praline <laughs> and we say it with that accent because like <laughs> people make pralines all across the south even Absolutely. if they originate yeah. here and in a lot of the south people do say praline so there's yes. not a right pronunciation but there is a local pronunciation that is correct. And praline, just there is a linguistic connection, though, that I think it's important just to know, just know it. OK, <laughs> you don't have to change the way you talk, but you got to know that it is named for an individual whose name, a Frenchman, whose name was de Praslin. And so Praslin, praline, there is a thread of connectivity there. And, and that's really why we pronounce it the way we do here in New Orleans. And a praline here is when you've had too much to drink and you begging for mercy and you're like, oh, like, oh God, help me. Praying and leaning at Praying the same time. Praying and leaning, you know, so. And so I love Leah's, but my favorite thing that Leah's does, <laughs> bacon, pecan, brittle. And, and if you have ever mm. had the glorious combination of sweet and a little bit salty, this is for you. Oh um. yeah. <laughs> okay. It really works well together, I think. I was imagining this in advance, and it's a whole different level above what I was picturing. Yeah. Now the camera's all sticky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Occupational hazards. <laughs> we have to somehow manage to eat one more thing. So, okay. Fine, pardon us. <laughs> um, so, if we can, like, get one more thing in our faces after dessert. I mean, it's ambitious, but a po' boy? Oh. Are we capable? Yeah, we have to be. I mean, this is our 
duty to the people. <laughs> we're going to try a po' boy, y'all. And as traditional as we've mostly been so far, we're going to go a little non-traditional for this one. So we have a last walk to do out to, on the other side of Bourbon Street, the Aaron Rose Bar and Killer Po' Boys. Nice. So that's next. Awesome. Let's do it. Y'all, we crossed Bourbon Street and went a little up in the quarter to get out to mostly a bar called the Aaron Rose. So this is an Irish themed bar, very well known for their Bloody Marys, their Irish coffees and Guinness access. But they also have a little space in the back of Killer Po' Boys. And we actually went to another location of Killer Po' Boys. They have a couple in the French Quarter. This one's closed right now, but if y'all come and visit, very good chance they'll be available. And Killer Po' Boys is my personal favorite po' boy place in the it? quarter, okay. but it's like not a first po' boy experience because it's not a classic. And so... Yeah, they're they're off center of traditional very, a little bit, but good good quality, excellent po' boy. Is. So a po' boy is very similar to a hoagie or a sub, right? Um, it gets started in 1929 in New Orleans. There's this huge transit strike. The streetcar operators and mechanics are on strike. It was one of the most violent strikes in the U.S. It was contentious. They burned streetcars. There were riots. It was madness, right? The company's whole thing was starving them out, just waiting until they were hungry enough to quit. And a couple brothers with a coffee shop in the French market named the Martin Brothers started making these sandwiches on, well, we call it New Orleans French style bread, but it's actually kind of a little bit of a German roll at the same time. It's kind of one of these cross hybrid things. Um, but they, they would get these, these loaves from German bakers around the corner and they put fried potatoes inside and maybe a little bit of au jus from this roast beef sandwich that they made at Martin's Coffee. And they gave them away for free to the po' boys on the streetcar line who were striking. Right? Uh huh. The name. And so, po' boy, and then also a very cheap sandwich. It was an inexpensive food for maybe you know a, a, a worker who didn't have a lot of cash on hands. Right. And that gives us the origin, which like when you see these really early po' boys, it's not what you think of as a super New Orleansy food. It's not. It's, I mean, you, you get into like roast beef po' boys as kind of the the deepest, closest connection to that. And we just call it debris. It's like all yeah. the little fragments of roast beef from the bottom Slow of- Slow roasted. <laughs> and real roast. juicy, like super messy. Like the bread is the face. napkin. Yeah, yes, um, the bread is the napkin. It's like yeah. a real crusty bread, but it's very, it's very absorbent on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. And to this day, it's German bread. Most places that serve po' boys are stocking Leidenheimer bread. Yes. So it's still got those original roots, but you today get like, fried shrimp po' boys, fried oyster po' boys, and many other variations yeah. that are more contemporary and feel more New Orleans-y to, to a visitor. And I would say like when you're looking at what a traditional po' boy is, that's, that's what a traditional yeah. po' boy is today. So as we said, <laughs> Killer Po' Boys is coloring outside the lines. This is a very non-traditional po' boy. So we're looking at what? So we've got the thing you're not allowed to have in gumbo. We got carrots going on in here. There's shrimp as a base, but you've also got daikon. We got what looks like some cucumber in there. Some cilantro. Some cilantro. It, it looks like a banh mi. Andrew. So this is getting us into <laughs> like, if there is a latest wave in New Orleans fusion, banh mi is right on the money. Yeah, Vietnamese is the hot new kid on the block in <laughs> New Orleans cuisine. <laughs> new uh, kid on the block means 1970s. Right, yeah, 1975, following the Vietnam War, Catholic Social Services helped to place a large number of Vietnamese exiles in and around Louisiana. And elements of Southeast Asian, particularly Vietnamese cuisine, are starting to make their way onto plates in New Orleans and blending very well with our traditional Cajun and Creole style of food. And this is where like, just in the same way that Cajun food had not made it out of homes and into restaurants in New Orleans a few decades ago, we're kind of at the point where, yes, you can find great Vietnamese restaurants in New Orleans, tons of them, or places that serve some Vietnamese items, but they're not in the French Quarter as of pretty recently. Correct. You can yeah. go a little outside the quarter to the business district and hit up Fatal Bai or you can go further afield and find lots of great ones in the general area that some tourists will be going to, but most of them are over on the West Bank across the river. And it's a whole different side of town where you would, you, you kind of wouldn't know if you didn't know New Orleans well, that you were right. even in our city. Right. My partner 
<laughs> is the son of Vietnamese immigrants. And I get to eat his mother's food oh, all the time. I'm so jealous of that. So, I mean, she's the only reason I can tolerate spiciness. So I'm, I'm like mm. learning a lot from so her good. besides the fusion. But like fusion is happening in her kitchen. And it's just a reminder yeah. that like her gumbo and her jambalaya are incredible, but they're, they are a new kind of traditional that's in the making. So yes. we're never done with this stuff, I guess is the point. Exactly. New Orleans cuisine is a living, breathing body of work. We are holding down some old traditions and doing things in some really old school ways here. But when you're coming to New Orleans, don't just look at Cajun and Creole food. Look at the full spectrum of what the New Orleans demographic is. And it's a very multicultural, multi-ethnic place. Uh, and Vietnamese food and Louisiana food blending beautifully together in restaurants and in homes. Would you like to give this a try? Yeah. Go for it. I'll join you in just a second. Y'all, chances are, if you're watching this, you might have encountered New Orleans food in the past. If you've managed to make any of these things at home, if this is giving you ideas for things to make at home, or if you have a high priority for a restaurant in New Orleans you know and love that you want to get back to, or one that you want to try for the first time, <laughs> let us know down in the comments. And we're definitely working continuously on more tours. We want to get out to other parts of the state, see some of the origin places of Cajun food and so on that we're talking about. So let us know what you would like to see out of us. And we hope you can come and take this tour in person and we can give you the latest updates on what the city is producing and what's in season during the time that you're around. Let us know all that stuff down in the comments. Hit the like button, subscribe. You'll also find that information to drop your tips to Kayla. Thank you for that. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for your time. Thank you. That is where it's at, yes. Perfect example. No, this was ideal. This was ideal. So we forgot to mention chicory in relation <laughs> to New Orleans coffee. So James, why don't you tell the people about mm. chicory? You guys, you're missing out. I don't know how they forgot to talk about the chicory. It's a lot better than the sugary ass donuts. But at some point in history, people were poor, which has happened a lot in the history of New Orleans, as you well know. Uh, and they, they couldn't get enough coffee. And so they would take the, the roots of the chicory plant. Chicory is kind of like a green onion, uh, kind of in that greens family. I don't know. Endive. It's in the endive family. Endive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and they would grind it up and mix it with the coffee to make it go further. It makes it bitter. It makes it sharp. It's a very good digestive and it's liver a cleanser. Very yes. good liver cleanser. <laughs> and it is delicious. And my father drank a cup of it every morning when I was growing up, but I couldn't stand the smell of it. And then I started drinking it, and now I can't go without it. You gotta have it.